If you found out that your childhood imaginary friend was secretly a demon that feeds on the souls of innocent kids, what the hell would you do? When Jess and her family move back into her old house, their youngest daughter quickly makes a new pal in the form of a harmless looking teddy bear. But it isn't long before things take a deadly turn, and Jess is forced to face the demons of her past to save them. We're here to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat Chauncey the demonic bear in Imaginary. <laughs> This family is about to have the most insane week of their lives. Early one morning, this woman Jess suddenly wakes up from a terrible nightmare. Her husband Max asks if everything's alright, and Jess explains that she was just having another one of her reoccurring bad dreams. They're getting ready to move back into her childhood home, and since she knows that it used to be her happy place, Max here suggests that maybe moving in a few days early will help to clear her mind. But that that was their biggest mistake. They end up moving into their house along with Max's two daughters from another relationship. Alice and her teenage sister Taylor. The girl's parents split up after their mother suffered a severe mental breakdown, and while Jess and Alice seem to be getting along, Taylor isn't as eager to accept her into the family. The next day, Jess is busy working on some drawings for her series of children's books. That's when Alice comes along and suggests that they take a break to play a game of hide and seek instead. While she's supposed to be choosing a place to hide, Jess steps outside to take a call from her man. Manager. Meanwhile, Alice begins searching the house by herself when she hears a strange voice luring her to check the basement. Nervously making her way down amongst the dust and cobwebs, she eventually comes to a small door, hidden behind a bunch of stacked up old junk. Opening it, she discovers a hidden crawl space with a lonely looking teddy bear sitting in the darkness on the other side. Alice immediately begins to speak to the bear telepathically, finding out his name is Chong and he tells her that he's always hungry. As the two of them head back upstairs, the door slowly creaks shut on its own. Coming back inside, Jess asks Alice if she still wants to play, but the girl abruptly says that she's found someone else to play with instead, and closes the door in Jess's face without saying another word. Okay, let me just stop everything right here, and you tell me if you haven't seen this one before. An unsuspecting family moves into a new old house. Yippee! Things start off normally enough until one day, little Timmy here decides to take a trip down to the basement and discovers the cursed yo-yo of eternal torment, like he always does. Damn it, Timmy! Why can't you just go watch Gumball and play Roblox like a normal kid your age instead? Next thing you know, Timmy here starts making friends with another little kid who lives in the walls, and then boom! One thing's for sure, Jess and the fam have about, mm, oh, I don't know, 48 hours before Alice here starts crawling up the walls and doing Tony Hawk 360s with her head. So they need to nip this shit in the bud as soon as humanly possible. But the question is, how? Well, before she can do anything about it, the first step is to identify that we've got a problem and that this new friend of Alice's might be something more unfriendly. I hate to say it, no, really, I hate to say it, but it's giving early warning signs of something supernatural. Here at How To Beat, we've been around the block enough times to know how this works. Let's just all agree that in the future, if you ever move into a house where no one has lived for decades since an unexplainable tragedy occurred on the property, bring in the professionals before you go getting involved with it yourself. The key is to identify the source of any potential problems before it has a chance to start manipulating the kids. But now that it looks like the process has already started with Alice, Jess should also try to find out more about her past and what exactly happened with her family. Possibly by asking around with some of her old neighbors or by doing some research to see if anything comes up in old news articles or police reports. In the meantime, I'd do something to get Alice out of the house, like send her and her sister out to meet some other kids in the neighborhood and then have a look around her room while she's gone. If Jess finds anything strange in there that she doesn't remember moving in with, for example, a moldy old teddy bear, then it's time to get rid of it before Captain Howdy shows up to crash the party. This kid is probably going to be upset when she finds out 
out, and just getting her a replacement bear might not be enough to cut it. Maybe getting her a real fuzzy friend to play with instead might help to get her mind off of her so-called buddy, Chauncey. A puppy's a big commitment to make, but it's better than the alternative of dealing with a demonic possession, so it's probably worth a try. Back upstairs, Taylor is busy taking selfies in her bedroom when she suddenly notices a strange old woman staring up at her through the window. Angry, she rushes outside to confront her, but by the time that she gets there, the woman is already long gone. She ends up meeting the neighbor's teenaged son, Liam, who explains that the old woman is a local from the neighborhood named Gloria, and she's probably just upset because she's been trying to buy the house too. That night, while her parents are getting ready for bed, Alice shows up in the doorway saying that she's playing a game of hide and seek with her new friend Chauncey, and that he's going to be looking for her soon. Playing along, Jess tells her to hide under the sheets between the two of them. It seems like harmless fun at first, but after a moment, Jess starts to think that she actually heard something. Concerned, she peeks out from the covers, but finds no one there. Until suddenly, Alice leans down from the other side and shouts in Jess's face, scaring the crap out of her. They laugh it off as a silly prank, never suspecting that the bear has been lurking in the shadows all along. While Jess is working on her drawings the next morning, Alice comes looking for her holding a basket and a handwritten list explaining that she's playing a new game with Chauncey and needs to find something happy. Thinking of it, Jess draws a smiley face onto a blue bouncy ball and gives it to Alice. Crossing the first item off of her list, after dark, Jess is still up working late when she suddenly hears the unmistakable sound of a bouncing ball from somewhere downstairs. Thinking that it must be Alice, she quickly goes to investigate, but finds the ball sitting at the top of the basement stairs, and somehow, the face has been changed from a smiley face into a frown. As she steps forward, the ball fades away deeper into the basement, leading her straight to a box full of drawings that Jess had made as a child, including one that's only of a small blue door with the words never ever scribbled menacingly at the bottom of the page. Okay, what? Did this woman just suddenly get hit with the SpongeBob orb of confusion or something? Jess knows that she made a smiley face on that ball, so unless this house is full of those exact blue bouncy balls, and whiteout markers, then what she's just seen should have not been possible. And what does she do? She shrugs it off like she sees this kind of stuff every day. By the way, Jess, those bounces didn't exactly sound like bounces to me. They sounded more like someone forcefully throwing that ball against the basement door. Alice? Obviously, something was trying to lure her down there, and I'm not sure exactly why yet, but I'm damn sure that it's not going to be good. Also, Jess walked down there thinking that it was Alice of all people. I'm a grown ass man and I wouldn't even go down there in the dark like that. Get real. I'm even scared of my own basement. In the meantime, Jess needs to learn more about Alice's new friend. The two of them starting off playing hide and seek is fine, but now, suddenly, there's a scavenger hunt list that no one else is allowed to see? I'm sorry, but hell to the gnaw on that one. Letting Alice know that we're suspicious might backfire and cause her to act even more secretive. So instead, I'd wait for the right moment when she was either asleep or out of the house and get a good look at that list for myself. Also, according to Alice, Chauncey is always hungry, and that does not sound good. Maybe ask her what he's hungry for, and if she tells you that it's the souls of the innocent, then it's time to say, forget the house and book the next flight to the Vatican City. Something else worth pointing out is that before going to bed, Jess mentioned to her husband that she doesn't remember having an imaginary friend as a child or really anything much about the earlier years of her life at all. We know that Jess left the house to live with her grandma when she was five after some kind of traumatic event. Most kids have imaginary friends from around age two to around age 10 and permanent memories start to form right around the time that you turn four years old. The drawings all over the walls and her career choice as an adult definitely make it seem like Jess here would have had a very active imagination as a kid. So it's odd that she wouldn't have had an imaginary friend at some point in her life. Especially when you consider that, according to studies, more than 65% of children say that they've had one. From all of the home videos, it looks like she and her family were happy together, but then one day her loving father just snapped? Maybe it's time to get suspicious and try to figure out what really happened back then. 
So what explanations could there be for her forgetting? The answer could be called a phenomenon called childhood amnesia. As a child between the ages of three to five years old, you'd think that if something really terrifying happened to you, then it would be etched into your memories forever. But that's not always the case. Instead, the brain sometimes intentionally blocks or suppresses those memories as a way to protect the child from severe emotional damage. With this in mind, it's definitely possible that Jess unconsciously blocked out the memories to move on from some traumatic incident that happened in her past. We've already mentioned checking in with the neighbors and doing some research on her own, but now we might have another lead. That ball led her straight to a box full of stuff that she made right around that age. So Jess should try looking through it to see if anything in there might jog her memory before it's a bit too late. Heading back upstairs, Jess goes looking for Alice and finds the girl in her bedroom having a tea party with her best buddy Chauncey. At first, she thinks that it's nothing but some childhood cuteness, but just then, Alice tells someone that she likes her dress, and a hoarse voice whispers back, thank you. Confused, Jess begins to crack the door open a bit further, and that's when she sees an adult figure hurriedly rush out of sight. Suddenly, a strange adult woman bursts through the door and knocks Jess to the ground. It's the kid's estranged mother, and as Taylor rushes in to calm her down, she blurts out that there's someone here, and that she came to protect her girls. When the cops arrive to take the woman home, Jess finds out that Taylor had been secretly texting her mother about the move, which is how she learned where they live. Taylor just wanted another chance to see her again, but obviously that didn't work out for the best. Back inside, Jess goes to Alice's room to make sure that she's doing all right, but the girl insists that she wasn't scared. She explains that Chauncey promised to always protect her and says that he can even make the scars on her arm go away someday, adding that he thinks Jess should understand since she had a friend just like him once too. With everyone in bed for the night, Jess and Max hear Alice playing with Chauncey in her room and notice that the girl has started speaking in the bear's voice. Jess thinks that it must be some kind of self-soothing response to their chaotic day, but the truth is that it's the beginning of something much worse. As Alice drifts off to sleep, Chauncey snuggles up closer to her, now seemingly able to move on his own. The next morning, while Jess is out working in the backyard, Alice is back to playing her scavenger hunt game, and she asks Jess for one of her extra paintbrushes. Crossing another item off the list, Max here is just about to head off on tour with his band for a while, and as the girls are seeing him off, Jess bumps into that creepy neighbor Gloria from a few days back. The woman introduces herself and explains that she used to be Jess's babysitter, but isn't surprised to hear that Jess was too young at the time to recognize her all these years later. They start by making some normal small talk, but the woman suddenly gets very interested when Jess mentions Alice's new imaginary friend. She explains that Jess used to have an imaginary friend too, and sometimes her imagination was so strong that Gloria almost believed it was real. The conversation turns to Jess's father, and Gloria says that after she became a famous author, the man would sit down on the porch for hours at a time reading her books over and over again. Noticing that she's upset, Gloria apologizes for bringing up painful memories, but Jess here has just decided that it's time to go visit her old man. Okay, things are starting to escalate, and it's time to take a moment to break down some of the weird stuff that we've just seen. First, we have the incident with the girl's biological mom. Before the woman was taken away, she mentioned that there was someone here, and that she came to protect her kids. That does not sound good. She may not be in the most clear state of mind, but whatever she knows, I'd have a few questions about it, and I might have tried to talk to her a bit more before they took her back to the hospital to see what I could figure out. After that, when Jess went to check in with Alice, the girl mentioned Chauncey, saying that Jess once had an imaginary friend just like him. But how would the bear know something about Jess that she doesn't even know about herself? Well, it could just be a lucky guess, but there's a chance that it's something more sinister. Plus, Alice suddenly speaking in the bear's voice can't be good, right? I'd be willing to ignore it under normal circumstances, but the evidence of supernatural interference here should be stacking up at this point for anyone who's been paying attention. Most importantly, we got our first glimpse at Alice and Chauncey's scavenger hunt list. 
first, we have something happy. All right, that's normal enough, but then what's that second thing under it? Something that burns? No, absolutely not, not once, not never. And then at the bottom, it looks like it says a lock of hair. Hello, what 10 year old goes around saying something like that? The last time that I heard the word lock was from Goldilocks and the Three Bears, and that story came out in 1837. It might seem like a small detail, but unless you're dealing with young Sheldon over here, then something about that doesn't really sit right with me. And it only gets worse when you learn what locks of hair are believed to signify. Traditionally, having a lock of someone else's hair is believed to give you magical powers over that person. And giving someone a lock of your hair was treated as a gesture of love and devotion. When you remember that Alice is doing this all at the request of a magical talking bear that she found down in the crawl space, it starts to seem a little less like a game and a little more like some kind of dark ritual. Finally, is Taylor not going to mention that the same creepy old lady who just introduced herself was staring up at her bedroom window two days ago? To make matters worse, Gloria here was the second person to mention this imaginary friend of hers that Jess doesn't even remember herself. And she even specifically mentioned that the friend was a he? Coincidence? Maybe, but maybe not. There's only really two solutions here. Step one, it's time for Alice to stop playing with Chauncey. She's not gonna like it, but it's better than letting her finish that game. Step two, Jess needs to figure out what really happened so that she can either put whatever spirit this is to rest or kick it out of their house for good. Maybe Gloria knows something that could be helpful and I might try finding out what else she knows because soon they're going to realize that she's not as out of it as she seems. Leaving Taylor to watch her sister, Jess heads down to the assisted living home where her father, Ben, is staying. She tries to jog his memory by showing him some home videos from the times before they grew apart, but by now the man is so far gone that he doesn't even recognize who she is. After hanging out with him for a while, she mentions that she needs to go back to the house. And that's when everything changes. Suddenly Ben jolts up in bed and warns her that she needs to stay away, shouting incoherently about someone or something that he calls CB. But before Jess can understand what he's saying, a nurse rushes in to calm the man down. Back at the house, Taylor finds Alice collecting a bunch of dead bugs in a jar as a part of Chauncey's game. And she explains that he promised to take her to the place where he lives if she's able to complete the entire list. Leaving her to it, Taylor decides to invite that kid Liam over to hang out. But Alice gets upset when he starts poking fun at her imaginary friend. It isn't long before the kid starts looking for trouble and he ends up shattering a bottle on the living room floor. So Taylor flips out and sends him upstairs to get some towels from the bathroom, with Liam having no idea that he's officially caught Chauncey's attention. While looking around upstairs, Liam hears a circus-like jingle coming from Alice's room, where he finds a spinning rainbow-colored lamp that's casting little bear shapes on the walls and ceiling. As he turns it off, he somehow hears the girl's voice in his head warning him to not touch her stuff. In the bathroom, he notices a pull string working its way up onto the countertop, and the towels briefly take the shape of a teddy bear before just as quickly returning to normal. Liam convinces himself that it's all in his head, but when he goes back into the hallway, the pull string starts tormenting him again, luring him back and forth around the second floor, until he sees Alice's blanket in the shape of a bear. The figure slowly moves towards him across the ground before suddenly lunging at him. And thanks to the wonderful love lovely content ID YouTube algorithm, we can't exactly show you what's happening on the screen right now from the movie, but take my word for it, things are happening. Taylor rushes upstairs to see what's going on, but just then, Jess returns from her trip and immediately throws him out without a second thought. Up in her studio, Jess notices that one of her newest paintings of Simon the Spider had its face torn out while she was away. Jess heads into Alice's bedroom, where she quickly takes a picture of the front half of Chauncey's scavenger hunt list. It seems like Alice is pretending to be asleep under the covers, so Jess takes a seat on the bed and reminds her that it's 
it's not okay to go around tearing up other people's stuff. Jess takes a peek out the window and suddenly realizes that Alice has been in the backyard playing by herself the whole time. But who was really hiding under the covers? Her best buddy Chauncey, of course. Jess doubles back to have another look at that list, and on the reverse side of the paper, she sees that the challenges get more and more dangerous the closer that you are to finishing the game. All the while, she has no idea that a demonic figure is quietly watching her from just out in the hallway. Outside, Alice is busy tearing off a board from the fence, and she places it nail side up in the middle of the picnic table. For some reason, Chauncey wants her to do this as a part of his game, making the nail appear like nothing but a harmless flower. But Jess manages to run in and push the board out of the way just in time. Okay, the game has officially gone on too far. It started out harmless enough, collecting smiley faces and paint brushes, but now we're up to cutting the faces out of pictures and playing patty cake with a rusty nail. This scavenger hunt just took a dark turn into full-blown goblin behavior, so guess what? No more games and no more Chauncey. Sorry, kiddo, but if I were Jess, then the next thing that I'd be doing is burning that list, the bear, the lamp, and anything else around the house that even remotely reminds them of Chauncey's existence. But like we mentioned before, the best solution is to find some other way to channel her imagination, like getting her some new toys or even resorting to desperate measures and giving the kid an iPad to distract her. Whatever it takes to make sure that she leaves Chauncey and his games in the past. As for Jess, it's honestly impressive that she's somehow still living in denial about what's really going on here. I mean, she saw Chauncey moving around under the covers in Alice's room. How many more impossible sights will this woman behold before she just gives us more than just a, huh, that was strange, because it's starting to get frustrating. I don't know what's wrong with her, but if it were me, Chauncey here would have been going face first into a wood chipper a long time ago. Alice is lucky that she just got a little boo-boo this time around, but they need to stop this friendship now before things are allowed to go any further. You dig? After talking it over with the girl's father, Jess decides to call in some backup from a local child psychologist named Dr. Soto. She does her best to explain the situation, and the doctor thinks that Alice's imaginary friend is most likely a way to help her cope with the recent changes in the girl's life. Setting up a camera in the living room, the doctor begins to interview Alice, who immediately asks if Chauncey can join them, grabbing him from the other room and setting him down next to her on the couch. The interview starts out normal enough, but when Dr. Soto brings up the scavenger hunt game, the girl's attitude begins to change. All of a sudden, she starts arguing back and forth with Chauncey, switching between his voice and her own Gollum style, as if he has her under some sort of mind control. Realizing that things have gone too far, Dr. Soto tries to calm Alice down. But as the girl turns to face her, she sees that Chauncey is somehow still speaking with her voice, even though Alice's mouth isn't moving at all, and he threatens to hurt the doctor and even her grandkids if she ever comes back. Worried, Dr. Soto pulls Jess aside to have a word with her privately. She mentions that during their conversation, Alice brought up a place called the Never Ever, which reminds her of something that another young client of hers said some 10 years before. In the end, the boy ends up going missing, and no trace of him was ever found. Hearing this, Jess suddenly remembers the painting that she made as a child and runs to grab it from downstairs for the doc. Thinking it over, she wisely decides that it's time to get rid of the bear. But there's a problem. According to DeSoto, she never saw any bear, and neither has Taylor. Sure enough, in the doctor's recording and every picture on Jess's phone, no bear, proving that Chauncey himself has been a figment of their imaginations all along. But the danger is still very real. Okay. This looks bad, but we might have just learned something very important here. We now know that Chauncey manipulates Alice by saying that her family doesn't love her as a way to turn her against Jess. So all that Jess needs to do is prove to Alice that she really does love the kid to win her back. Sometimes that can be easier said than done, but hey, they could always go adopt that puppy that she's been wanting. The key here really is to just play with Alice and make her feel like she doesn't need someone to love her or keep her safe because she already has Jess. 
and this should effectively cancel out Chauncey's power over her. Dr. Soto here probably thinks that it's all in their heads, and that's understandable, but by now, Jess should know for sure that that's not the case. Need more proof? How about the fact that Alice most likely could not have known about the woman's granddaughters without being told? It's another sign of that forbidden knowledge that we talked about before, but at this point, I think we're all well aware that something unnatural is going on here. Even Dr. Soto seemed shaken up and in a rush to get out of this crazy house. Since we just found out that there's no physical version of Chauncey to even get rid of, it seems like their only choices are to bring in the experts, like a priest or spiritual healer, who can identify and possibly drive out the evil spirit, or just pack it up and leave while they still have the chance. The house may have cured Jess's nightmares, but I'd take a few bad dreams over full-blown visual hallucinations of a bear who tries to get you to open a portal to the underworld any day. Upstairs, Alice's bedroom door slowly creaks open and the mysterious voice lures her out of bed, calling her over to Jess's studio where she finds Chauncey waiting for her with the rest of his list. Putting her under his control, he makes the girl go back down to the secret room in the basement, commanding her to paint a blue door on the wall before placing all of the items into a bowl and setting them on fire to start his dark ritual. By the time that Jess finally realizes what happened, Alice has already disappeared into thin air, leaving behind the only painting on the wall as a sign of where she's gone. Hours go by, and the family still hasn't found any trace of her. Frustrated and holding Jess responsible, Taylor goes out to take another look around the neighborhood, where she accidentally runs into that creepy old lady from down the block. For some reason, Taylor thinks that it would be a good idea to follow this woman back to her house, and that's when she finds out why she's been so interested in their imaginary friends. It turns out that as a child, Jess had said similar things about going on a trip to the Never Ever, and on her last night of babysitting, Gloria here saw the girl open up a magical door straight through the damn wall. Ever since that night, she became obsessed with trying to understand what she saw. According to Gloria, imaginary friends are actually real spirits that thrive on the children's creativity. Most of them are friendly, but some, like Jess's, can be evil, and because her imagination was so powerful, Chauncey refused to let her go, waiting patiently for decades until he could find her again and make her stay with him forever. Meanwhile, Jess takes a closer look at some of her childhood drawings on the wall and realizes that CB was just her childish way of writing her initials CB, Chauncey Bear. Just then, Taylor rushes into the house accompanied by Gloria, and the three of them start working on a plan to get Alice back. They realize that the key to finding her must have something to do with the scavenger hunt. And after regrouping downstairs around the kitchen table, they begin gathering up items and crossing them off from the list. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. They know where Alice was taken, and they have an idea of how to get there. There's only one thing left to do at a time like this. Get weapons, because I have a bad feeling that Chauncey won't be letting her go without a fight. I'd also make sure to grab a flashlight in case Imagination Land turns out to be dark, and a healthy amount of string or some paint so that they can mark their way back to the exit once they're inside. Speaking of paint, they might be able to use their creativity in another way. Once they're in Imagination Land, Maybe they'll be able to create weapons or other useful tools out of thin air, or even dream up their own imaginary friends that can help them fight Chauncey. If the only limit is their imagination, then they could probably come up with a trio of pretty formidable avatars that would do the fighting for them while they focus on searching for Alice. It's really a pretty viable strategy, and since there's no telling what is or isn't possible once they're on the other side, I'd be trying anything and everything that I could think of to see what worked. Of course, they could always try to find another kid from the neighborhood with a strong imagination and try to use them as a meat shield, sacrificing them to Chauncey instead so that they can get Alice back. I'd say that kid Liam would be a good fit, but unfortunately, I don't think he's going to have enough brain power between those ears to satisfy the bear. Let's save that move for when we're really desperate though, because for now, it looks like they might actually be able to beat Chauncey at his own game. After taking it all down to the secret room in the basement, Jessica strikes a match and places it into the bowl, lighting the items on fire, but there's still one last requirement that they need to start the ritual, something that hurts. 
In that moment, Jess starts insulting Taylor in a very personal and upsetting way, blaming her for what happened, since she was too self-obsessed to even look at her own sister. Just then, the flame starts to glow blue as an unnatural wind sweeps through the basement and the door on the wall begins to open, allowing them to cross over into Chauncey's home. All of a sudden, the women find themselves transported into some kind of M.C. Escher-looking imagination land. The doorway out of there quickly begins to close behind them, but Taylor's able to jam it open just in time. While the other two are still processing what the hell they're even seeing, Gloria here starts going off like Willy Wonka, starting another tour of his chocolate factory. But there's no time to be suspicious of her now. They have to find Alice first. Exploring one of the passageways, Jess eventually finds a small window, and by looking through it, she's finally able to see what really happened to her dad. The truth is that when Jess was originally taken by Chauncey, her father went into the imagination world to save her, but on their way out, he was attacked by the creature and ended up being exposed to the collective imaginations of all the children in the world in the process, causing him to lose his mind as a result. While Jess and Taylor are distracted by this revelation. The old woman suddenly returns to the doorway and seals it shut, trapping them inside. It looks like crazy Gloria here was working for Chauncey all along, and she says that now the five of them will have a place where they can be together forever. But just as she finishes up her evil rant, one of the doorways opens up and a massive bear paw grabs her by the head, dragging the woman out of sight to a violent and bloody death. Okay, well, it looks like Gloria here won't be peeking into anyone's windows for a while. What was going on with this lady's head? I mean, seriously, she was the one who figured out that Chauncey was evil, but then she decided to work with him? I guess that plan didn't work out like she thought now, did it? I've got three words for you, Gloria. You fucked up. Question. What was the end goal here, exactly? Did she really want to be trapped inside of this imaginary hellscape with a demonic grizzly bear forever? Boomers, man. I swear, she knew Chauncey wanted Jess and Alice for their ultra-powerful imaginations. So what use would he have for a dusty old woman who spent decades researching him, but wasn't creative enough to figure out a way to get there for herself? Even when Jess used to talk about this place as a kid, she said that it was only for her and Chauncey. So once again, what made crazy old Gloria here think that she'd be allowed to stay? No wonder she was the first one to get clapped by the bear. Now, let's not forget that she actively let Jess go the first time. What the hell kind of babysitter lets a five-year-old kid crawl through a wall portal? After something like that, I'm genuinely surprised that she wasn't investigated by the police. At her age, if she really wanted to go to Never Ever Land, then all that she'd need to do is wait a few more years, but it looks like she ended up speeding up that process anyway. When your evil plot ends with you being mauled to death by a demonic teddy bear, Gloria, you f***ed up! The two of them continue exploring deeper into the hallways, and this time, they come to a door that's marked with the same number as their old apartment. Checking Alice's room, they finally find her inside having a princess tea party, surrounded by everything that she'd ever wanted. The three of them aren't alone though, the girl's mother is there too, but Jess can immediately tell that the woman is really just another one of Chauncey's tricks. Thinking quickly, Jess starts tearing up anything blue that she can find in the room and using it to create another door in the wall with the power of imagination. Since it looks like fun, Alice here decides to join in, and to everyone's surprise, it seems like it's actually working. Furious, the imposter tries to stop them, but Taylor absolutely bodies her into a pile of empty boxes. And after a moment, the real Chauncey emerges in his true demonic bear form. Alice and Taylor manage to escape, but the door slams shut before Jess can follow them through. And before she knows it, she's being sucked down through the floor like it just turned into some kind of imaginary quicksand. With the creature looming over her, Jess reaches for her scissors at the last second and jams them directly into Chauncey's eye, causing him to lurch backwards in pain. Falling through the floor, Jess finds herself back in the original set of hallways, but the creature is closing in right behind her. 
The good news is that it doesn't seem to be in much of a rush, and before it can get to her, Jess manages to pry the exit open with her scissors, falling back into the basement where Taylor and Alice are waiting for her. For a while, it seems like the nightmare is finally over, but one day, while Jess and the others are visiting her father, she realizes that something about them is not right. Suddenly, the lights go out, and everyone in the room sprouts lifeless doll eyes, surrounding Jess and telling her that the only way Chauncey will let the girls go free is if she agrees to stay with him forever instead. Reluctantly, Jess accepts her fate, but just at that moment, Taylor comes in and clubs the demonic version of herself over the head with a field hockey stick, telling Jess that they need to get out of there. They rush for the exit again as the spider-like demon chases them through the halls, escaping into the basement and starting to seal the doorway up with black paint. But before they can finish, the demon grabs Jess and starts trying to drag her back in. But Alice quickly ignites a puddle of flammable liquid, causing Chauncey and the whole damn house to burst into flames. Our heroes manage to escape just as the world's fastest fire department arrives on the scene. But Jess says that they should let the house burn, finally having learned the most important lesson of all. If your kid has an overactive imagination, just sit them in front of an iPad so they can rot their brain that way instead. But what would you do? If I moved into a house with my kid and a brand new teddy bear popped up and her behavior started changing, you know, I'm just the kind of parent that would take the bear and rip its head off in front of my own kid to prove that I ain't f***ing around with that Satan sh**, that demonic sh**, that extracurricular, you know, demon, you know, we ain't f***ing with all that. No, 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 no. You, you know what I'm saying, right? But let us know down in the comments what you would have done. Thank you so much for watching. Leave a like and subscribe and check out that How To Beat playlist for more videos just like this one. I'll see you in the next video and uh, have a damn good day. No, for real, have one.